The building blocks that marketing gave me was insane. You know, it was insane. Like, for instance, uh, I'll get right back to what you asked, but there was this term in marketing called SWAT. And it's not uh, S-W-A-T, it's S-W-O-T. And I feel like that kind of structured my life in a big way because the definition is, is, is in marketing, if you know your SWAT, which is your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities and threats, cool. mm-hmm. if you put that, if you, if you really, and be honest with yourself, whether it's finances, whether it's your career, whatever it is, if you put that SWAT in front of you and say, hey, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What are the opportunities and what are the threats? If you really drill those down, there's nothing that you can't achieve because now you know what your strengths are, so you push those up. Now you know what your weaknesses are. You need to fix those. Those opportunities, you need to go after them. Yeah. And the threats, you got to figure out why they threats. Because once you know something, once something's a threat, you got the answers. It's just like some people say, I'm not afraid of the dark. I'm afraid of what's in the dark. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's that. And then uh, also the MVP. And we're not talking about the most valuable player. It's the most, uh, it's the minimum viable product. So many people got these big dreams of, you know, saying, oh, I want to have this huge company or I want to do this major feature film. And they never even get off ground one. Mm -hmm. What that marketing class taught me was to dumb it down to the minimum viable product. What can you do with your budget? Right now, I don't care if it's $100. Mm -hmm. What can, how, how, how close can you get to getting that done? Just so you can get an eye on, okay, this worked, but how can I make that grow? And from that, you just start building. I don't care if you got this, this crazy idea about a magical coffee cup. Okay, well, that magical coffee cup is going to cost you a million dollars to really get made. So what you do is you take that regular cup, go put a sticker on it, and tell people what it will be about. Now make 60 of those, go sit somewhere, and get the people's ideas. Mm-hmm. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? Now you got numbers, and it's power in numbers, especially with the Internet. Now you've got a, a, a following to say, hey, the people want this. And then you just start rolling. But if you're just so busy trying to get that magical coffee cup, yeah. you ain't going to get a million dollars just by talking about a magical yeah. coffee cup. Yeah. <laughs> you know no, 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 that's a fact. And I'm, I'm glad you said that because it all intertwines, right? Mm-hmm. It all intertwines. When we talk about entertainment, entrepreneurship, business, and that's kind of the beauty of the podcast is that everything, if you really are aware of mm-hmm. You can really maximize your potential if you understand the business behind it, right? Mm-hmm. So, like what you just broke down with the SWAT, that was about, I never actually heard anybody yeah. say that before. That's so, like, that's a you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, yeah. right? Like, so, all right. So, now, as far as being an actor, right? Because we know that a lot of people aspire to be an actor, right. but they don't understand the financial side. I kind of compare it to being an athlete. People always say, like, how do athletes go broke, right? But they don't know that they might only get paid two times a month. They don't know that by right. they, they play in a different state and they, they pay state taxes in each state that they play in, that there's fees that come out. There's a lot of things that go into it. It's not as, oh, I got $50 million, right? Like, Absolutely. you might not even see a quarter of that because yeah. it's not guaranteed. It's, it's so much stuff, yeah. right? So, acting is, is kind of similar where people, you know, they look at actors like, oh, everybody's falling out of control, but there's a lot of financial things that go into being an actor that people don't, don't understand, right? Absolutely. You should talk about it. Well, like, first and foremost, one of the things I'd say again is it was a big shock. Like, nobody out here had jobs. Yeah. Like, here I am. I come from Oakland, so I, I started out working at Home Depot. You know what I mean? And all my friends that were actors, they just never went to work. I'm like, well, why am I the only one going to work? <laughs> Back then, I, I hated it. They'd be at pool parties. They'd be chilling. Oh man, it was, it was, it was a rough time for me. It was a rough one. Cause I just didn't understand it. And you know, and there's so many different hustles and side hustles. There's so many things to distract you from the craft. And that's why I'm glad that I stayed with my guns and stayed working and always hustled. And you know, as I got older, I started to appreciate what working really done for me and you know, my life. But what people don't understand in the whole acting game is, is they confuse it. People are, they, they, people are saying, Oh, being a struggling actor, that's what it is, and all stuff. No, I think people are totally wrong about that. You don't have to be a struggling actor. You need to find a path. You need to feed the need. And I don't want to sound funny, but I've always used this analogy, which may be a bad one. Mm-hmm. But a crackhead is going to do whatever that person needs to do to get cracked. They will steal from their mama. They will rob a car. They don't care. It's so deep invested in them. Then they're going to do whatever to do to get the crack, which is terrible. It's a terrible thing. 
But when you love acting as much as those people need that drug, yeah. you do whatever you got to do to feed the need. People want if you're starving, you can't be starving and going to an audition and not seem desperate. Right. You just can't. Yeah, and that, that, that was like one of the things I think last year when uh, Jeffrey Owens and whoever's not familiar with that was the gentleman from the Cosby Show. Right. When they saw him working at the supermarket, people were like, oh my gosh, look what he's doing. But he's like, no, I'm in between kids right now. This is a real life yeah, grind. Absolutely. And like, that's why I said one of the things that, that you made evidence, like, yo, I work at home. Well, I, I did these jobs. Yeah. He says, yeah, I'm too good, but I got to hustle. And I think people overlook that. They want the claim. It's Hollywood. I want to be famous. And it's like, nah. There's a grind. Like, that's, you earn that vision, right? Absolutely. 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 And, and what, what happens in the, in the, uh, in the, in between, call it that purgatory state, you know, purgatory is, you know, between heaven and hell. Mm-hmm. What happens is, is that people get lost. People really get lost because they want the fame, they want the money. And, and I don't want to be like, I've always been Mr. Uh, Diddy Two Shoes because I wanted all that at a time too. Yeah. But all it did was make me feel like less of a man. Less of a person, less of an actor, because um, I forget who told me, but they said the uh, no, it's actually uh, in the Bible, but I'm not super, you know, re- religious. But it said the sheep that stray furthest away from the shepherd are the ones that get attacked by the wolves first, mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. But it's true because the shepherd, the shepherd's there to protect them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? If you stay close to it, then you're good. But same thing with the game. Like if you stay close to it, and all you're doing is acting class. Working out, trying to do plays, watching plays, you don't see that glitz and glam world. So it doesn't affect you. Like you're in this bubble because all you want to do is act and people don't do that. Yeah. They start to get to LA and you start to see these things and it's such a distraction. And when that happens, financially you start to feel crippled. You're like, here I am working at this damn Starbucks or working whatever just so I can go to auditions. For what? I'm wasting my life. I'm wasting my time. But that's because they start looking outside instead of inside. Because yeah. if you would have just kept your little apartment, stayed focused, stayed grinding, stayed patient, then you would have been good. Yeah. Finances don't come into it then yeah. because you're following a dream. That's true. Like it, it's true. like you'll see who has a passion, who's fight chasing their purpose. Yeah, that's right. Like, you, like just hearing you talk about it, it's like you can hear the purpose. Like this is what I was meant to do. Whereas people who don't, it's like right, they're gonna. Fizzle out. Absolutely. Right? Because it's like, Absolutely. I'm just doing it because I want to be known. Yeah. And then one of the big, one of the bigger things, just to, just to piggyback on what, what you were saying earlier, I came in and I had, uh, I had natural talent. I, I was naturally talented from like the energy and whatever, but skill and talent are two different things. Absolutely. Two different things. Right. So I was naturally talented and I booked, I had like, I booked like four commercials in one year. There was a Dr. Pepper, which I shot with LL Cool J. That was crazy because that was the last commercial that Run DMC had done together before he died. J. J. Right. Yeah. That was the last one. It was a Dr. Pepper joint. So that ran like crazy, yeah. which had me paid. Um, I did the uh, McDonald's commercial, did a PlayStation 2 and a Reebok, all in the same year. You know what I mean? And then uh, my mom and my dad were super, super excited. But my dad, my dad is, is real hard nosed. He's like, you the man, right? right? You need to go buy your own house. Well, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so like the expectations, right? Uh, like ballpark numbers. How much would a, a commercial pay? How much would being a, a, a extra? Cause I, I see like even like rappers and stuff. I've seen like interviews where they're, they're like in movies, but I think I forgot who Cameron. Cameron did pay them for it. He said he got $5,000 for it. And if yeah. you think I'm like pay them for it, that's a classic, at least in the hood, right? Yeah, yeah, classic yeah. at least, but it's like, I wouldn't, I would have thought he got paid more than $5,000. Nah, He's a lead actor. Nah, now nah, well, you got, you got to understand the business of acting. Like when you, when you start out, whenever you see somebody that's on, you got to know that, that for a year and a half, I don't care the stuff you see, mm-hmm. they weren't getting paid like that. You're getting paid at a quote. That's why when you got a good agent or a good manager, they you whatever you made that last TV show, yeah. that's what they get to go off of. And if the, if the movie or the TV show is big enough, you'll knock that quote down. You know what I mean? If, if my quote right now is at $10,000 an episode, but a show like, this is us, or the marvelous Miss Maisel said, well, well, we'll take them, but we can only maybe do five grand. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do it because, because it, they know it'll catapult my career to the next level. They got a huge audience. Absolutely. So when you see these people that you don't know, you see them on the shows or whatever, no, no. And you know who does make money like that? When you see people like Flo. That Flo is, is, is the face of progressive. Mm-hmm. That is a contract. Yeah, yeah. That is a contract. She yeah, she never, you know, <laughs> that is a contract. But when you see, like, even when you see me, like, on, like, say, from a SWAT, I've, I've done 
damn near four shows in like less than four months. It's been a great year. But each of those, all it did was piggyback off the quotes, off the quotes, off the quotes. And now I'm at a point where it's like, okay, give me while I'm cheap. Mm. And you better do it because I know where I'm going to go. And even if that doesn't pop the way I need it to pop, is why I start writing and the producing. Well, to the next yeah, you know what I'm saying? Well, because thing. you got to control your destiny. You got to control your fate. And the bad part about it is, is that as African Americans, we have, uh, we've been dumbed down to believe that we can't do a lot of things that we can. Because all, all movie, movies are is telling stories. Yeah. And they make us believe only stories we can tell is about cracking in the cities, somebody, mom or daddy being gone. All that is, is not or, true. Or it's like the, the slavery time period. It's like we never get to tell these authentic stories from all the Exactly. It's enough, though. It's enough. Everybody does not come from poverty. Right. All these right. things, is, right. it's not the truth. But every time something gets championed or highlighted, it's got to be about negative things or slavery or whatever when we people just like anybody yeah. else. You know? And that's why us is so good because... What happens is, as African American writers, we feel like we got to put on a show. So instead of laughing with us, you're laughing at us. Mm. When you usually see a white comedy, you just laughing at their comedy. Yeah. You never be like, "Oh, I'm gonna go watch a white movie." Because yeah, oh, we're saying that's a movie. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. But you'll be like, "I'm gonna go watch a black film," and that's what I think us did. It took those color lines off because we didn't need the hey, hey, hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't see nobody sagging. You didn't see no guns. It was just a black. Family just done it all. That's, very you know what I mean? And, very, and, it, yeah. and that was it. And you didn't say, oh, it's a black movie because there was no remnants of that. You know, yeah. everybody was just acting. Yeah, it was it was dope. It was like, I think uh, Shana had this conversation like when we watched Insecure. It was like, yo, black professionals, like those are like the women that we know. Exactly. Right? But the thing is, we, we're waiting for that. And next thing is like, yo, young black males were doing similar things, have mm-hmm. great stories who don't come from poverty, who never sold drugs, who are professionals like, we need that. On it's, coming. It's, it's coming. coming. it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's and I, I'm I'm almost ashamed because when I saw Black Panther, mm-hmm. I had never seen black so beautiful. I just hadn't like a bald head black woman looking that like the whole cast. Shout out to Oka. Right, the whole cast. I'm just like wow. And I was like, first I was ashamed, but then I was like, my whole life I have never seen that. My whole life I have never seen. Yeah. Black is beautiful on that level. We talking about superheroes. Yeah. The whole time you're seeing Superman, Batman, all these other so people, cool. which is cool. I'm not hating on it, but to see it and me be this old and have to take a breath, like, wow. Sort of it just shows you what happens. And then now you, you start to see that we can tell our own stories. We can start producing because that, I would say, is what changed me as an actor because I was like, you know what? I can tell my story. My story is from Oakland. My story is about my family. My little sister, uh, my baby sister has breast cancer. There's a lot of things going on in Oakland that, that I don't approve of, but I feel like I had a hand in that because I'm a very educated person. I'm very well spoken, but if you, if everybody who has talent leaves the city and doesn't reach his hand back, whose fault is that? 